Welcome all to the Rossi Institute in Stockholm. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, open session seminar about organizing for digitalization. Uh, we have two keynote speakers here and we have a panel of two commentators, but we will also have an open discussion here. And uh, we have a very good mixture, I think, in the audience of some people doing research about these issues, uh, some people working in business, uh, organizing for digitalization on a daily basis, but also some people from governmental agencies and departments uh, creating policies for enabling the digitalization of the Swedish economy. And uh, we have two full hours actually. Uh, we'll see if we continue that long. And after the seminar, we'll have an informal reception here. And for this reception, we will also have some participants coming for the conference, academic conference that starts tomorrow on the very same theme, and where our two panel speakers, our keynote speakers, will, will be having introductions as well. But we will have, I think, around 20 scholars from around the world for this conference. Anyway, so it's my great pleasure to welcome two keynote speakers here today. Uh, leading experts in this field of organizing for digitalization. And I will present both of you and then you will speak in order. And uh, the first speaker will be Professor J.P. Eggers from New York University, Stern School of Business. Professor Eggers is an expert, I would say, on the role of emerging technologies and the role and effects in organizations and how it affects management and so on. Expert on technological change, decision making under uncertainty and new product development. Uh, it will be very interesting to hear what Professor Eggers had to say. Our other keynote speaker is a native Swede who did his PhD in Uppsala. I work at Han Chalmers in Göteborg. You did in Umeå, and then at Chalmers in Göteborg, at the Victoria Institute in Göteborg, but nowadays at Warwick University. And he has a very long, impressive title here. He's a professor and head of the Information System and Management Group at Warwick Business School. It's a pleasure to have you here. And uh, you're also, I would say, an expert on emerging technologies, the transformation potential of digital, digital technology, as it pervades modern business and entrepreneurship. And you teach digital business strategy and digital innovation. So uh, we also very much look forward to your presentation. We will also have two commentators who will open up the discussion. And one of those are Magnus Berg, uh, working nowadays at the digital communication company, Tria, Tria. Is that how you would present it, or? Mobile operator, but also have a long background at Ericsson, working with, yeah, digital communication in a very wide sense on a worldwide basis, I would say. But we also have Magnus Maring uh, at the, the Stockholm School of Economics, also professor of business development, innovation, and so on. Also worked extensively on digitalization and these kind of issues also as a consultant working close to business and so on. So, Professor Egger, the floor is, floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm uh, really excited to be here and get a chance to meet people and talk with you. I'm also excited because this is my first trip to Sweden, uh, at least for any extensive period of time, and so get a chance to, came in last Friday, get a chance to experience some of the, the, the country and the, the culture and things like that. Uh, it's been it's been a great experience and a lot of fun for me uh, to to get a chance to do this. I apologize if the reason we're doing this all in English today is because I speak no Swedish other than like talk. I think it's about the best I can do for the most part. Um, but uh, but I, I'm glad you guys are all here and I, I look forward to comments and questions from from the the panelists and from the audience as well. So I'm I, I'm more of a general strategy leaning person in the sense that I'm mostly interested in thinking about. 
uh, the way organizations are actually run and the way that managers make decisions in those organizations. And so to some extent, I'm going to focus, uh, I'm really going to focus less on how organizations may uh, organize for digitization than how digital technologies transforms the way organizations actually structure themselves, right? The way that they actually are trying to do business in this way. Um, and I'll start, whoops, I'll start with a graph. And I'm, I'm an American, I'm an American institution. I'm going to give you American data for the most part, mostly American examples. I apologize, but it's kind of what I know best anyway. Um, and so I'll start with, with this graph. And what this graph shows, um, the red line is the number of IPOs, public offerings on the US stock exchange, on the stock exchanges uh, over the years. And we can see this huge run up here. That's the internet bubble in the late, 19, in the late 1990s. Um, but the general trend we would see is that there's, well, there's, there's a small gap in here. The number's been relatively high, and the number's been pretty small in this case. What the blue line shows is the number of companies actually listed on U.S. stock exchanges, whether it be the, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. And again, we can see this peak that comes in up here. But even if we take out, at least to some extent, the peak, we can see this kind of pretty clear descending line kind of going on here. There are fewer and fewer publicly traded companies in existence in the U.S., and this has been a trend that's been going on for a number of years, even kind of after the, 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 the post-IPO bubble, uh, the post-internet uh, bubble in here, even in kind of the, the, the bubble that kind of happened in here as well, we see a little bit of a displacement effect here. But in general, the, the trend's been going down. There's been a lot of discussion in the U.S. about why this is going on, what's happening, and what's, what's, what, why are we seeing this happening among the U.S. firms, um, and to some extent reflected elsewhere beyond the, the U.S., though not entirely, as a number of other countries has been kind of ramping up their stock exchanges. And really, I think there's two real explanations for this puzzle. And when I've talked about this, I think I kind of offer these two. So the first one, maybe since I'm right here, I'll just switch to this. The first one, I would say, is it's become less and less appealing to be a publicly, publicly traded company in the U.S., now, this is, a lot of this is related to things about governance, activist investors, the short-term focus of publicly, publicly traded firms have been kind of subjected to in many cases. And while this is, to me, a terribly interesting topic, this is kind of a topic for a different day. This is kind of a different conversation about kind of why it's become so much worse to be a public, public, publicly traded firm in the U.S. But it's an important answer to this question. The other answer that's out here is the one that's much more relevant for today. And I would argue it's that it's become much less important and much less necessary for firms to be publicly traded companies. There's been much less of a need for massive capital investment. Originally, firms went public in the US because they were railroads and they needed to lay track across the entire country. They were big manufacturers. They needed investment capital to open new plants and facilities and things like that. Um, these things are still important. These big investments are important. But to some extent, it's, it, it's firms are able to access those investments not by making them themselves, but by buying those investments or, and accessing them on the open market. Uh, and this is kind of where I think, to me, the role of digital technology plays a, plays a key factor. Let me explain kind of what I mean by this. Um, right, so kind of uh, the point I'm going to try and make is that this idea that, that this reshaping of the boundaries of the firm has been driven in part by digital technologies and what they've done to organizations. So. I used to talk about this as kind of the Nikeification of business. That's not an actual word, but uh, I think you get, you get the point. This reliance on partners. And there's a whole bunch of negative sides of the Nike story where Nike's gotten itself into trouble. But the underlying story is this. Nike in 2012 employed a little less than 45,000 people, but generated more than $24 billion in revenue. At the time, um, if you looked at their ratio of sales to employees, the, number, the amount of total sales they had to the number of employees, it was the only uh, non-financial, non-energy firm in the top 15 in the US. Um, it was one, you know, the only one at that point in time. They had outsourced all their manufacturing to Asian partners. They had outsourced some of their design even to design shops. All the Nike clothing is designed and, and provided through outside licenses. They don't actually provide any, any of it them themselves. And so if you look, this is actually from their, their website, um, they've got product development, they've got marketing, and they have this Nike branded stores but all the raw materials, all the manufacturing, all the, the retail, for the most part, in, in either online and physical goods, is mostly been shipped out to partners, right? They've kind of been taking on less and less of a role of this themselves. And if you look across uh, a number of industries and a number of data, this is data from 2014, 2015. Um, these are the top 10 firms at this point in time in terms of the revenues per employee, right? The, number, the amount of revenue they produce per employee in the firm. We've got some pharmacy sourcing companies, which is kind of a, a specific phenomenon to the US. 
um, and, and the way pharmacy and, and, and pharmaceuticals are handled there. We've got a, a straight up pharmaceuticals company. We've got a plastics company. We've got a healthcare system, agriculture, entertainment. Here's Netflix and Apple coming in electronics, agriculture, a number of different industries. And a number of these firms are in industries we, we traditionally would think of as being relatively capital intensive. They would require a big investment in, in many of these ways. And these firms, we would expect then it'd be difficult to kind of get this very high revenue per employees. And so the question is how, the, how, they've, been, how they've been able to do it. And I'll, I'll make an argument about how they've been able to do it, or maybe how other firms have been able to do it, through an example. It's a little bit of a silly one, but kind of work with me here. Let's build, a, I want to create a new product. This product's going to be a spy drone, right? It's going to be one of these things with a like, you know, drone. It's got a cameras on it, you know, very high definition camera, very good control system. We can fly it in and kind of you know, take pictures either as a government agency or a spy agency or you know, corporate espionage or who knows what. It's you want to take really cool pictures to put them on the, the, the new Apple TV apps and things like that, whatever it is you're thinking. So how are we going to do it? Well, what I want to do is I want to take on only design, marketing, and sales. I don't want to do anything else related to, to this thing. And I'll show you how easy it is to, to do this and, and make, this, make this work. So first, I'll get some shared office space at a company called WeWork in the US. It's kind of you know, shared physical office space. You can kind of come in, use desks in different cities. You can actually have a mailing address. You can have administrative staff in different places that kind of handles what you need in that, from that point of view. We can incorporate online. Here's the website for the Liberian Corporation's incorporation website. But you can go to a number of places and incorporate your company um, for relatively little money. We're going to need access to funding. I'm not going to go out and bother to try and get VC funding. I'm just going to create a Kickstarter page to try and get funding to come from uh, you know, potential investors or people, my first customers in this way. I'm going to need some programmers to write the code for this thing, but I'm just going to hire them through a company called Upwork. Right? This used to be called Odesk, and now it's called Upwork. You can go out and put in a pitch that you need 15 people to write code for certain things. You parse out the pieces, and then they go out and write it and, and bring it back to you. You never even have to see them physically face to face. We got to build it, but you know we can go to Alibaba's website and find some Chinese drone vendor. Once we give them the specifications, they can build this thing and actually manufacture it. Going to need to figure out how to get payments, but I can get Square or a company like that to try and help me figure out how to get the money in the first place. And I can have it shipped to the customers through Shipwire and never actually physically own, touch, hold this thing at all. Right? I never have to actually do anything with it in the first place. And so. I think it's relatively easy for you know, one person with, a with an idea of what they want to try and do to take on a very limited set of activities. And I can kind of design the thing. Then I'll go to a bunch of trade shows and try and show the thing off, get, get some sales interest, and, and, and then everything else will kind of be run this way. right? And what this is meant to suggest is this idea that digitization is going to be able to uh, allows us to provide solutions for what we typically think of as transaction costs. right? Transaction costs, if we go back to classic economics and kind of economics of organizing, this is kind of what dictates the boundaries of the firm, right? We're, we're trying to minimize the cost of transacting with in, the, in the open market, these issues around trust and identifying partners and reliability and all these things that mean we, we might vertically integrate and do them all within the firm. And the argument is that digitization provides some solutions for some of these transaction costs. They don't go away. They're not gone. They're not irrelevant, right? But they've been reduced. Right? How, that, how does this happen? Well, one of the classic costs of transacting is search. Right? How do I find potential partners to work with? It's just cumbersome and difficult. Now we've got all these marketplaces, business to business and business to consumers. We've got these open platforms that allow ideas to be come looking for companies. I can post what I need, and so people will come out, come out and find me. I don't have to actually even look for the partners in the first place. Well, we're concerned, concerned about trust, right? If, and we're concerned that if I have to contract out, I'm no longer certain of the quality of this person. They may want to take advantage of me. They want to exploit this relationship. How do I solve that? Well, we've got this rise of kind of ratings and crowd evaluation and ways to try and build reputation in that way. And in many cases, the platform itself provides the basis for trust and reputation, right? You trust the driver not because you know the driver, but because you trust Uber. Maybe you don't trust Uber, but whoever, you know, whatever kind of platform we're thinking about, right? Your trust is in the platform and their reputation and what they're putting out their, their name on it, not in terms of who the actual person is. Maybe we've been, we've been integrated because it's difficult to write those contracts. It's hard to kind of write the contracts in a way that, that in, in a repeated way. Well, a lot of those contracts are already built into these platforms, like some of the ones on the last page in the example. And if we need access to individual attorneys, we can do that relatively easily. We don't need to just have a, a, a long-standing relationship with a big law firm to get that kind of insight. 
we can buy that on a contractual basis as well. Now, maybe it's difficult to monitor the work of my partners. Well, in many cases, things like cameras, sensors, whatever it might be, allows for much closer monitoring. I've got colleagues at Stern who've been working on the, the, the efforts and the moves to install tracking systems into trucking companies so that the trucking companies will actually know how hard you push on the brake pedal, how hard you push on the, the, the gas pedal, where you stop, where you turn. That may disturb you. It probably should. There's all kinds of reasons it's not a great thing, um, and there, there are drawbacks to it. But from an organization's point of view, it allows much safer contracting because now I can, I can see exactly what my contractor is doing with my goods, and I don't just have to hope that they show up. And a, another key piece around transaction costs has been around coordination. These party parties need to work together, and so being in two separate firms makes it difficult. Well, as the Internet's given us faster and, and lower cost communications, it's also given us new collaboration tools. You know, as simple as things as Google Docs are, it has changed the way we are able to collaborate ac across organizations or the private walled communities you can build in, in some of these firms. And things like cloud services allows for, for increased specialization by organizations, right? Focusing more and more on what you do and letting your partners handle all the other things that are out there that might need to get done. The result has been that many companies have become more and more focused. They've stopped being very, very large and broad and become more focused. I put the asterisk up here. There's some very significant exceptions, right? There's in some ways, what we're actually seeing is a bit of a stratification, a handful of really big, massive, diversified firms, and then a whole bunch of these very specialized niche firms. But the, the, the point is that we, there's been a, 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 a an increased ability for these small, niche-focused firms to be successful, to transact in the marketplace, and to actually generate revenues. The platforms that are out there are able to provide coordination without ownership. So again, Uber's a good example. Uber's able to generate a lot of revenues, but they run a lean operation because they don't own the vehicles. Not yet, because we're not talking about self-driving cars quite yet. But until, you know, up, up until that point, they're able to outsource the owning of the vehicle. They provide a service as kind of a coordinator. More, more and more firms are being started that are providing these kind of coordination roles, either as a true platform like an Uber or as literally a coordinator who helps kind of coordinate sales with uh, manufacturing or distribution or things like that. We know from a lot of the research in economics and organizations that more focused firms tend to outcompete broader firms, right, in, in terms of the product quality of what they create in a certain area. And so by allowing firms to be more focused, we can actually maybe get access to these more focused, higher quality products that are out there through the advantages to specialization. And there's been this rise to high quality service businesses, right? Cloud computing, IT service outsourcing has kind of provided access to things that small firms never would have had 20 years, to even five years ago in some cases. And if you're a retailer and you want to have access to world-class distribution, you can do that through a partnership with Amazon, right? You don't need to actually go out build a relationship with, a, with a, a delivery service or things like that. And if that's kind of access to, sorry, backwards, access to kind of, you know, uh, some of these services and, and to customers, there's also been uh, access to production. So typically outsourcing has been all about access to lower cost environments, right? A chance to kind of outsource production because it allows us to, to reduce our production costs. Well, now we're seeing outsourcing of production less about reducing costs, but more about gaining access to high quality specialized production capabilities, like what you've seen Apple and pe people like that do through their, their network of relationships. But now it's not just Apple who can get access to that, but you and I can get access to those things as well, because it's easy to find those potential partners out there in order to do this. This has created lower cost and higher quality production in many cases. And innovations like 3D printing are only going to continue to accelerate this process over time. Now, I've made all these comments, but there's some key limitations. There's some key reasons why we're not seeing digitization kind of transforming everything. First off, communications is not coordination, right? True coordination is something more difficult and more, and more complex than simple communications. And it isn't always as easy to do that over things like email, even things like Skype and Google Docs. There's some limits around there. Having a reputation is a kind of a chicken and an egg problem. I don't know if that's a phrase in, in Swedish, but that's okay, good. I'm seeing some heads nod, right? You need the reputation in order to kind of get the customers, but you need the customers to have the rep reputation, so there's some real trade-offs there as well. And for all the brilliance around kind of open sourcing and crowdsourcing, this does not work for every decision, every firm, every innovative activity. There's some key limitations to think about there as well. But the basic story is we shouldn't expect companies now 
to continue to look like companies of old, right? The, the, the actual structure, the organization, the size of these firms should be transforming. We should be seeing leaner firms that are more reliant on outside partners. They're more distributed. They're more modular. And we're seeing this to some extent in the U.S. with an increase in spin-off activity. A lot more organizations, these bigger, larger firms, spinning off different parts of the firm, partly to get access to capital, but partly to focus in on what it is that they need to do. So there's been things like the eBay, PayPal, HP splitting, a number of other examples that have been out there as well. So to kind of provide some summary and to kind of think about, again, what the research that's out there has shown us about digitization and firm boundaries, there's kind of two primary forces from digitization that are affecting firm boundaries. The first one's been the, the theme that I've been mostly been pushing on here. Digital technologies make it easier to coordinate across boundaries, which leads to more outsourcing, smaller, leaner, more focused firms. It's not just call centers and basic ma manufacturing, and it's not just about low labor costs. It's about kind of this broader set of access. Less vertical integration, more focus on ecosystems, partnerships, relationships. The second one is that these digital technologies have enabled organizations to change, even if they don't change their boundaries, to change the way that they're structured physically, right? So we can be more distributed. We can be more decentralized. We can have more virtual coordination, which might enable physical dispersion. We can kind of have a broader ge geographic spread, more telecommuting, more access to different tools in that way. And this gives an ability to push decision making, which maybe had been more centralized, down in the organization, right? Because we can, we can see, monitor, understand what's happening. The, the risks of decentralizing decision making are, are going down. So what does this mean? Last slide. What do, what do managers need to do? Um, so many small firms are taking advantage of these opportunities. Um, in addition, some larger established firms are doing this as well. But not all of them, right? Many of these firms have been focused on what, I've, what I would call digitization 1.0, which is basically saying, how can we take the things we're currently doing now and use digital tools to help us do them better? As opposed to saying, now with these tools that we have, how can we rethink the structure, function, boundaries, and organization of our firm? So the objective should really be to re-envision this organizational structure based on technolo digital technologies. Identify your core competencies, the things that you are good at and that add real value, and focus around those. Find partner firms with complementary competencies, and reconsider how you internally structure your firm to gain access to and, and optimize around these core competencies. Okay? And that's it. With that, I'll hand it over to Ola. Thank you very much. Thanks. So we'll save questions to later and let Ola have the floor, please. All right. Thank you very much. After some uh, technical difficulties, I'm at Warwick Business School and um, I've been thinking about you know, exactly what to present here today, in, in a sense. And I wanted to come with uh, you know, s some sort of issue that, that would be fundamental to, to what digital brings to, to business. And I, I decided to, to go for uh, you know, a classic uh, theme, namely scaling. You know, how do you scale a firm? Because uh, there is something, you know, a, a really, really big difference between how to scale a traditional uh, manufacturing company like automotive where I've been working a lot for instance how you do that compared to scaling in digital in in many uh, in many situations today uh, you can actually see how both those worlds you know come together you know in the same company and uh, working across two different logics uh, I wanted to start saying that you know this is um, this is a one graph that I will a diagram I will come back to which really shows the uh, the growth of um, you know WeCash, a, a Chinese credit uh, rating uh, you know, company uh, in China, obviously, and how they grew in terms of number of uh, users and cust and, act and also corresponding uh, uh, customers from January to August. It's just uh, eight months here, with uh, a number of setbacks in the sense that you know they thought that oh, 85 uh, percent growth here wasn't uh, you know good enough that it needed to re rejuvenate uh, you know that that growth uh, kicked back to 131 uh, was down in June to 21 but just scaled uh, further today they have uh, this is two years ago and they have 20 million uh, users currently so this is growing you know um, along you know some would say an economist might say that this is uh, related to network effects but uh, as we will see in some of the stories I will tell around this, 
it's much more uh, agency involved where some of the uh, measures that the company did here in order to review net growth uh, you know, was pretty substantial. And um, one thing that I wanted to address here and, and, and use this uh, WeCash uh, as an example is really that digital technology offers, uh, you know, um, uh, the offering continues to be shaped after release. So in a sense, for each uh, hiccup in this curve, uh, we can actually see how the company, you know, re-identified themselves, uh, much because of the flexibility that, that digital technology uh, allowed. Uh, and that's something I will... Uh, I will propose that that's something that is different to digital entrepreneurship to entrepreneurship in, in general. Um, next slide. Uh, there is less predefinition on entre entrepreneurial agency in a sense, and that relates very much to what uh, JP just uh, talked about. Uh, this is Google Maps, and, and Google Maps, that's Royal Lemon, that's where I live. Uh, and uh, so it can be a standalone service at the same point as we know that it can be part of a component in many other services at the same time. This is very different from the kind of module, traditional modularity you would find in industrial organizations where a component for a camera, for instance, couldn't easily become a component in something else. You know, but uh, you would find Google Maps in, in as in right move here in the UK, that's a, that's a, a property listing service, uh, Hemnet it could be, you know, here, here in Sweden, or uh, it could be for the Craigslist, it could be for something else. But obviously, uh, uh, you know, there are more than um, uh, up to a thousand different services using the, the Google API in active services currently. Uh, meaning that uh, the way that uh, Google Maps becomes successful, uh, that agency is distributed across many more actors in a way. It's much more distributed compared to having the, you know, the company having the total uh, autonomy to, to make those moves. So less predefinition. I would say that's also related to the flexibility that digital technologies uh, offer. Uh, so this is a question, um, who is that? Um, I can tell you that an, it's an American uh, his, it can, it can business historian. Yeah, he's a business historian, American business historian. And it's uh, Chandler, it's Chandler, Alfred Chandler. He wrote, you know, one of the uh, most famous books uh, called um, e Economics of Scale and Scope, I think. And, uh, and it was based on four case studies. Uh, and the four case studies was really the growth and the building of GM, uh, Sears, Standard Oil, and DuPont. And uh, so that's a story, you know, how you would scale um, a, a manufacturing company, essentially. A company is... Uh, in, and, uh, one of the, the most important aspects to uh, his thesis is really how you organize and uh, uh, production. And uh, in order to scale, you really need to try to drive down uh, marginal cost. So uh, in order to be successful, you, you build large factories, uh, which uh, demands a large investment, of course. Uh, in order to be able to, for each unit produced, you would be able to you know, do it at the, at the low cost. Then you would uh, so the scaling, of course, uh, would um, you know it would take many many years, of course, to build the kind of distribution uh, systems and manufacturing systems that, that you would have in place for being a, a worldwide automotive company, uh, and uh, and so on and so forth. If you look at digital ventures, then uh, which is the context in, in which uh, uh, this is uh, placed. Uh, I'd find that the startups that build the business by drawing in on and adding to existing layers of digital infrastructure, in the sense that they don't build their own infrastructure, very much reminding of what you just said. You know, they're building on top of existing infrastructures in a pretty, uh, pretty smart way. It really changes uh, the the game. It makes scaling uh, qualitatively different. And there are three aspects here. Um, it's very generative in a sense. Uh, maybe it's that chicken and egg uh, kind of problem, but initial success increases likelihood that digital ventures will enjoy continued user growth. This is very true in any business, of course. I mean, it's true. I mean, if you have initial success, it increases the possibility to direct uh, new, new customers and so on and so forth. But the kind of, if you just think about Pokemon Go as an example, for instance, the kind of global reach in, in, the, in, the, in, in terms of uh, having initial success and, and increasing the, the user base. 
it, it's massive in the sense that, that it mainly because of some of the platforms you can use, whether it's crowdfunding platforms or whether it's platforms for delivery of the services. Whether it's, you know, of course, if you are successful on iOS and Android, it really means that you have global reach right away. If you compare it to the scaling that GM had to go through in order to establish themselves uh, you know, on, on markets worldwide, that's a very different, different story. At the same time, of course, GM and others are struggling today, of course, to, to integrate those two worlds because they are pretty stressed by uh, uh, the way that tech companies uh, are increasingly trying to, uh, you know, um, develop, you know, value and, and take away some of the value produced within their traditional systems, in a sense, where you would find, like, uh, you would find Microsoft, you would find Android, you would find Apple and other as players in the car, in a sense. Treated currently by manufacturers as, uh, as traditional uh, tier one suppliers, uh, although I would argue that they need to do something else. There is another aspect which is related to the speed, and 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 thirdly, the focus on user base, growing the number of users. Traditionally, when we measure companies, you know how they grow, would look at turnover, look at number of employees, uh, we'll look at market share, perhaps we we'll look at those kind of measures. One important, you know, those measures are still important. But one important early on measure for a digital venture is the user base, in the sense that it, it might come from a kind of winner takes it all kind of mentality you would find, but because, because of this fantastic uh, possibility to actually um, have a global business in a short time, it also means that you're more stressed to actually achieve that status early on, in a sense. So, um, meaning that it's important to build user base. Um, so what is it with digital technology that makes it, uh, you know, flexible? There are really two separations that, that digital uh, technology does. It's really the separation between contents and medium, uh, which really makes reproduction uh, virtually uh, at the cost of zero, in a sense. I mean, if you replicate software, it's not the same thing. So the marginal cost, if you think about, you know, the traditional way we've seen, uh, we've studied uh, scaling, um, the marginal cost is essentially th zeros, uh, which makes a, a, a big difference. It really enables, you know, uh, to, to increase the speed. The other thing is related to separation of form and function. You know, when you design this chair, for instance, this has a very, you know, the function and the form uh, are, are very integrated in a sense, because the way that, you know, it's designed, it also implies its function. So it's very difficult to change the function of this chair. You know, obviously, I can use it, um, and it's, it's for you know, primary function might be to sit on. A secondary function could be to change a light bulb or something. But, you know, there is a limit to the number of different functions that that chair can, can do. If you think about the computer, a computer is like an anything machine in the sense that you separate the, the, um, the function and the, the medium uh, through which that function is executed. So it really means that... Um, it can be reprogrammed, you know, in a sense. Which also means that, you know, once you have many users, for instance, that user, uh, user base can be further developed, you know, by, um, you know, developing new functionality. That also means that if you think about platforms like the iOS or Android, they're also, uh, they are expanding horizontally, in a sense, across industries in a way that we haven't seen before. Um, and that's very much related to, to this fact that it's possible. The, the, the iPhone can actually be uh, a heart rate monitor. It can be many different things. Uh, becoming a threat to you know, traditional medical uh, you know, devices and so on and so forth. That's true also for the car business that we talked about earlier. Uh, the fact that, um, you know, do you really need to have a specialized operating system in, in a car? And what extent can you actually draw on the information capabilities uh, that Google already have, you know, um, also for the car setting? And that's a major threat, of course, you know, for, for anyone. If you think about the camera industry, where uh, it used to be that um, 
you know, most people, most uh, companies in the camera industry consider themselves at, as in OEM. Uh, but of course, nowadays they're, uh, you know, mainly, uh, you know, tier, uh, tier one uh, suppliers. Uh, and it's not, usually not the same actors. So offering continues to be shaped after release. If you look at WeCash then, that I mentioned, uh, it, it's a Chinese entrepreneurial venture in the credit business. And one of the things they did early on, they started a company on one thing. They wanted to do credit ratings for micro, for micro uh, loans. And uh, they wanted to focus on, rather than ability to repay, as would be the normal you know, basis for doing uh, risk assessment, they are looking at willingness to repay. And, uh, and the kind of input they would use for, for making that judgment is uh, uh, social media profiles. So you would submit your, um, your access to your so social media account, and they would determine pretty fast uh, with an algorithm whether you would be a person willing to repay or not. You know, it sounds a bit uh, weird, but if you think about it, if I, if I, would, if I would lend you uh, 50 Swedish kroner here, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really, I, I wouldn't ask about your salary or, you know, if it's a micro loan, I wouldn't, the first thing comes to me is not whether you have salary enough, it's more whether, you know, I trust you to actually, you know, pay it back eventually and not forgetting about it. Uh, so, and I think that's the, that's the basis here in the sense that um, they've discovered that on the Chinese markets, the very few, uh, the middle class do not have uh, generally uh, credit cards. Uh, because usually they haven't developed the credit profile they would normally need to have in order to have a credit card. So, uh, and by doing, and then they wouldn't fit really on, on that end. And uh, so by developing this and, and seeing how consistent you are in your social relations and so on, you are uh, entitled to, uh, you know, a microloan. It was pretty successful. In, in eight months, they had 600,000 users. And... Uh, they were in at one and a half a after 12 months, and, and we're talking now 20 million. But across those eight months, we had three, three digital innovations, essentially, because there were two slowdowns in, in that process. And you can see them here again, you know, where the growth wasn't the double for each month, but it, you know, it went down. Each one of those represented uh, you know, redefinitions of what they were. They started as online micro-lending company. Uh, wanted to doing that risk assessment in order to you know be able to you know have a good judgment whether they can actually lend money or not. Um, that becomes so successful, so, th so they redefined partly their business by also allowing others you know to use their service. So they became an online credit rating uh, company. You know, providing this algorithm be be became more and more important uh, f for the business, and they were uh, you know. They were able to grow further. I, it even became popular among, among younger people, students and others, to be able to actually have a you know, preview whether you actually would be uh, able to, to get loans and so on and so forth. They, in the uh, month eight, they developed into what we refer to as a credit note service, which essentially that you had a, you had a predefined credit that you can use with certain vendors like Alibaba and others where you can actually use it almost like an account versus, uh, versus this credit versus this. And uh, the, uh, the, up, up, um, the advantage of, of, of doing this, if you cannot have a credit card, uh, you really need, to, and, and you want to have support with money at the point of uh, purchase, you need to be able to do that credit check very quickly. So they managed to do this, you know, in five minutes they could, uh, you know, Give uh, give that rating. This is a kind of a transformation that is, you know, it's just an, an example from WeCash. It's an early digital venture. Uh, as I said, it's it's really big now. And what they're doing now is actually allowing others to use their. They are saying, you know, build your business on our business. So other people that want to be in the micro lending uh, business can actually use their technology, uh, because the the current main asset is basically this algorithm and the fact that. Uh, yeah, so, but I wanted to use that example as a way of uh, looking at, you know, I could see, you know, three different mechanisms ongoing here. They were very engaged in uh, what we refer to as data-driven operation, in the sense that much of the data they used here um, uh, 
they use lots of data in, in the residents being able to redefine what they, they did o over time, but also be able to do instant releases of new versions of, of this software. So this kind of uh, instant release is very different from uh, the, the kind of way it reminds of a, a traditional software business. Yeah, right. And uh, well, it's quite different from the automotive setting where I've been, uh, you know, working before. They also went through what what we refer to as swift transformation. Then, you know, the the building this kind of platform business allow allow them to also redefine partly what they do. I have some uh, data for this, but we don't need to have a closer look at it. I wanted to say, you know, lastly, then, uh, you know, um, a few things about this less predefinition of entrepreneurial agency. The fact that you, I mean. We can see with WeCash here that they started as something, but they realized pretty soon that in order to keep growth, the kind of market they were building wasn't big enough. So they needed to, you know, to um, you know, shift their direction a little in a sense, building on what they already built and attracting, you know, the user base they already have and building it further. That's possible because of the um, because of the uh, the uh, flexibility of digital technology. But another fact here uh, that uh, uh, relates is really what we see with the use of different boundary resources like APIs and other things. If you look at Google Maps, for instance, we all know Google Maps. It is certainly a standalone application, but it's, uh, it's also used in other applications using their uh, API, becoming extremely successful in, in attracting a, a big user base. It also provides uh, data uh, that can be extremely valuable in their business. So, uh, so uh, the Google's um, APIs here uh, makes uh, Google Maps parts of hundreds of other services. So that means they're also part of multiple value paths, which helps scaling the service horizontally. That's what I'm saying in, in terms of they may be focused on um, I mean, in a sense, that maybe that's an example of, of the company that can expand horizontally, in a sense, becoming wider in scope rather than, you know, more focused, uh, in a sense. So what I wanted to say here is really that, so what's special about digital ventures and in terms of the way that they can scale? Uh, well, features of the offering can continue to evolve even after release. So in a sense, there's much more flexibility to sense and respond to the market, in a sense. Uh, there is less predefinition of entrepreneurial agency. If you just think about the store of iOS, we might think that it's always been possible to do native apps on the iOS, but it hasn't. You know, it started out as, as they wanted to do it in the browser with the mobile services and so on. But over time, they changed. Um, over time, they also realized you know, who they need to partner with and how, you know, uh, successful third-party application developers have managed to, you know, make the platform more valuable. So in that sense, um, uh, the kind of vendors or the kind of suppliers you would find in this kind of endeavor is very, you know, less predefined as you would normally think, uh, think about it. All right, many thanks. There are a few references there. All right.